Om Shanti everyone. Today, we are going to talk about power to judge or power to decide. Because this is one of the very important power, just like power of tolerance and power of um, power of accepting us together. This way, power to judge or power to decide is also very important. Like, like we have seen in power of tolerance and power of accommodation, when we're not able to accommodate a problem, then we go and talk to other people and create more confusion. So in the same way, power to judge and power to discriminate also go hand in hand. For example, if a person is able to discriminate between a situation, but is not able to decide which way to go, that will also cause a lot of confusion and hence cause loss to that person. So the power to judge or power to decide goes hand in hand with all other three powers, the power of tolerate, power of accommodation, and power of discrimination. And in life, as you know, as you have seen, that we, we get situations where we have to decide constantly. Like when we get up, the first thing we think, what are we going to do first? What are we going to do in our day? Then it could be, what am I going to wear today? Or what am I going to eat today? In such small, small situation, we have to we have to decide. We all thought that only when something very critical comes our way, then only we have to decide. And when we take these big decisions, when we take these decisions, they lead to our destiny. They decide our destiny. They shape up our life. And that's why that's why it said that the outcome of our life is based on the decisions we have taken. 
and hence we are the only person responsible for our life. And today, a successful person is a person who is able to take a right decision at the right time. And most of us are not even aware of the right time and hence are not able to take the right decision. As Didi said, challenges are there for everyone. And for some people, these challenges may open the door for success. And for some people, they create loss, they create, they close the doors. As Didi just mentioned that the challenges are for everyone. For some people, it opens the door for success. And for some people, it closes the door for opportunities. And when that, when that happens, then of course it leads to a lot of, um, lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. And the outcome, what happens, is a result of the decision which we took, which wasn't a right decision. And then we repent or we regret that I wish I knew this better or I wish I had the power or I wish I understood this better. So that's why it's very important to know what is the right time and how to decide at the right time and how to decide what is right for me. And when a situation comes in our life, any situation always demands a response from us. And most of us get very scared or get stressed or are in fear. And when we are in all these, all these um, emotions, then we are not able to decide properly. So it's very important to be very balanced when a situation arises, when a response is required from us. It is very important to be in a very balanced state because when we take the right decision, then there are many doors which open for us. But the moment you go in confusion, the moment you go in fear or in anxiety, then your decision is based on that. And then the opportunity just leaves your door. And then that creates the cycle of, again, regret and repent and then questions that if I wish I could have done this, then I would have I would have reached such big heights either in my career or in my life. So it's very important whenever a situation comes, it's asking from us a response. It's asking us us. You know, what are you going to do? What's your next step? 
and then if you and then if you go into that question series oh i was very confused i was not in a good mood i was very confused as to what to do and then you end up taking a wrong decision and when you're constantly in this thought or in negative thoughts then your intellect is not that sharp you're under a lot of confusion and it's not clear to you what decision you need to make and when you keep me making wrong decision then you end up doubting yourself your confidence goes for a toss and then that could lead to depression because you realize that every time you're making a mistake didi remembers a very a very nice story related to this that a, that a businessman wanted to go to delhi wanted to go to delhi in india um for for a business and the story is like long long time back so he he had a horse and um he wanted to take some special mud some medical property mud and he put and it he had uh, sorry he had buffalo he had buffalo so he was carrying the mud on the buffalo so that he could sell in delhi but while on his journey on his journey um on his journey while he was walking he kept giving he kept giving people who came on on came in his way he started giving them uh, the mud the medicinal uh, a uh, mud and uh, so one bag of the mud was done was done with they were done giving with, to everyone so that created an imbalance on the buffalo so then one then one person said, suggested that why don't you pick up the sand of the desert which they were passing through why don't you pick up the sand and fill it up so then you have a balance of one side sand and one side the medicinal mud so someone who saw them asked them asked him asked him what are you doing and they said well you know we finished one bag we finished one bag and just to have a balance we collected the sand from the desert and fill it up so that there was equal balance on the buffalo so the person said instead of doing that why didn't you just divide that one bag into two and then you know balance the weight why did you have to add more weight onto it there was no need to add more sand because you could have just used that bag that one bag and divided that and balanced it out so the, the you know the, the 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 employees of the of the businessman understood um and they said why don't you come and tell this to the business person um let him tell him because he's the one who's making this decision so they went so that so the passer by went and told the businessman his idea and the business person asked who are you um so he said i'm also a business person who's coming from delhi 
and he said that when i went to when i went to do business in delhi i went there but i felt sick and to treat myself all my money was used and when i got better since i did not have any money because all my money was used in my treatment i i was returning back to my uh, city so the business person said okay fine and then they left the scene and they started walking towards the destination so the employer asked why didn't you listen to the passer by who gave you this suggestion and that is why even if his suggestion was right but he was an unsuccessful business person so i'm not going to accept his advice right i will accept the advice of a person who has been successful in his life because sometimes what happens is when we have a situation we normally ask people and when we use somebody else's advice and if it doesn't work in our favor then we blame the other person and then say this is because of the other person's advice and then people usually come and say why did you use your intellect and then we say oh i did not you i had to ask his help because i was very confused and that's why when you take advice from someone who himself is not that successful you won't get a successful advice and that's why it's very important to understand how the intellect takes these decisions it seems it's said that when when a human being is born that time our intellect is very clear and there's no strings there's no overlap there's no entanglement and slowly slowly when the child when the baby gathers information based on that information he then has these stories or he then has the strings in his head did is giving an example of a badminton racket you know like how the strings of a badminton racket are so in the same way when we go through life we create strings in our mind and by 16 years old we create a badminton racket like a you know we create strings in our brain which is like a badminton racket and that is why you know a 16 year old teenager when he is told by his parents of anything the child only says i know i know i got it you don't have to tell me you don't have to give me instructions so what he's actually trying to say that my brain is functioning i have my own wires wires in my intellect and i can take my own i can take my own decision and hence i don't need your advice
and then they you know they they tell their parents that you don't understand there's a generation gap and i am completely able to take my to take decisions for my life and let me play or let me take let me take my own decisions for my life and usually it's found in america that by 16 or by 18 um children of year become independent and then they start staying by themselves because they feel their parents interference and they don't like it. and and the moment they start taking their decisions they are they are sometimes that they are they can take beautiful decisions for themselves and sometimes the child is able to help their parents in making a decision because it's usually found that the parents might be going through a problem and a child comes and asks um and when the parents tell them the problem the child is able to help him with a good decision because his network his network his badminton network that is what the analogy uh, didi is using is very fresh his his strings is his mind is very fresh and he's he's able to give a better perspective for the problem and then usually parents find it very sweet or find it very um uh are very surprised that the child is able to see and solve the problem in such a simple manner and that's because that's because he he has a fresh perspective and we the parent you know living for so many years we are not we don't have the freshness in our mind we don't have the clarity in our mind or the new perspective and the child sometimes gives us a new perspective to see the situation and that is why after 40 50 years of life you know you will see that small small things start giving you stress usually when a baby is born he's given two gifts so the first one is his first the intelligence and the second freedom of making those choices and this this is usually what the child comes with two gifts freedom of choice and an intelligence and and an intelligence and god also gives us because when god gives us these two gifts and he tells us that i have given you a uh, intelligence and i've given you power of choice so now you go and you will decide and you will be responsible for your life because usually you'll see uh, small children will immediately catch you when you're lying and will come and tell you oh i think that was a lie 
you know, when parents are saying something or pretending to do something, the child will immediately catch and say that, no, you're lying. And then in turn, what do we tell, you know, in turn, what, what we say to the child is, oh, please, be quiet. You don't understand this. And the child then says, well, I know you're saying wrong. How are you telling me that I don't understand when I can clearly see you as my parent are saying wrong things? And then the child starts thinking that my intelligence is telling me that what my parents are doing is wrong, but they are telling me not to speak anything not to say anything. And usually parents usually say, when the grown-ups are talking, you know, don't interfere. But the child is very confused because the child can see that, but in turn, we are telling the child that you don't understand things so out of the situation. Because as a child, again, we have got these two gifts, the intelligence and freedom of choice. Now, when the child is growing in an environment, the environment plays a big, important, a big role on the child's upbringing. If the child is brought up in a very loving atmosphere, then that has an impression on his, on his attitude or on his impressions or on his intelligence. And other, like, I, likewise, if he's brought up in a very negative environment, not a, um, not, a, uh, not a conducive environment, then that also affects his growth. And then when he watches things around him, then that's how then he develops his own, he develops his attitude, he develops his personality. And then he also responds to the situation the same way as a grown-ups are. So typically an in intelligence, you know, how does this work? How does this intelligence work? Normally, intelligence is also called as the third eye. So the mind will have a lot of thoughts and all these thoughts come into the intellect. And the intellect is then looking at all these thoughts which are created by the mind and tries to analyze these thoughts, tries to analyze this, tries to judge these thoughts, and then based on this, it then tries to decide. So it's also called the third eye of the soul, in which it watches all the thoughts created by the mind, then analyzes those thoughts, and understands those thoughts, And then based on all, all the process of um, seeing the thoughts, of understanding the thoughts, of using your own judgment, of, um, of seeing, what, you know, seeing what is right or wrong, which thought is right or wrong. And based on that, then they decide. But these days, most of us don't go through these process and directly just take a decision without even going through the steps or without even thinking about it. And that's why it said that think properly before, before you decide.
And these days, what people are doing is that first they decide and then they think whether that was the right decision or not. It's just like a courtroom scene, like a lawyer first will put the case in front of a judge. And the lawyer will give all the points, both the lawyers will give the points, you know, against it or for it. And all the points are discussed and brought to the judge. And then the judge first understands what the lawyers have said, analyzes it, finds the truth in it, and then makes a decision. So our mind is like the judge where the thoughts are emerging. And our intellect is like the judge that based on the thoughts, based on whatever is presented to us, the judge will then decide what is the right decision to take. And all, thirdly, the intelligence or the intellect is also called as your inner voice or your intuition, your inner voice. And your inner voice is always going to be right. will always give you the right answer. So for example, if someone wants to, you know, wants to murder someone or wants to rob someone, it's not easy to do that. And usually the first time, the first time when he does it, his, his hands might tremble, you know, he might sweat. And there will be a constant voice that no, this is not correct. Don't do it. Don't do it. So that is why it's said that whenever a person has to do something wrong, he first has to kill his conscious, his own conscious. He first has to kill his own inner voice or he has to like subdue and suppress his all inner voice before he takes that step. Because the inner voice is always going to remind you and tell you that this is wrong. And then slowly, slowly, we get into the habit of suppressing or killing our conscious. And then, then it becomes very difficult to come back um, because we have stopped listening to our inner voice, to our true consciousness. And whenever we take a right decision, you know, you have this feeling of very peacefulness um, within yourself. Even if you haven't achieved anything, materialistic things, a materialistic thing out of it, but still you have that, you have that peaceness within you because you have taken the right decision. Monetarily, it might not help you, but you are at peace with yourself. Because the inner voice is always guiding. It's always guiding you to take the right decision. So there are four aspects to it. The first one is psychological positioning. And what does that mean? That whenever we see a situation, a positive situation or a negative situation, 
whenever we see a situation, our mind mind uh, takes a stand, takes a position, a positive position or a negative position. So, for example, a robber, when he just comes out of jail and he's suddenly very hungry and he doesn't have money to buy food and suddenly he sees, suddenly he sees a house which is open. So at that time, what will his mind tell him? Because his positioning is not correct, and since he's a robber, the first thought will be of going inside and just taking, robbing the food or taking it. So it depends upon how you have your intellect positioned, positive or negative. So the way it's positioned, based on that, you will then decide, and the robber will definitely go and open the door. Like the example about uh, half filled water, when you see a half glass uh, water, you know, when some people see that it is half empty and some people see it's half full. So then that's the positioning, right? When you see half empty, that's like negative positioning, and half full is positive positioning. So then Didi is asking you a question that if someone sees a glass, which is, if the, someone sees a glass half full and he has a thought that, you know, let me go and fill this glass of water. Let me go and fill it up so that it's full. So then what do you think? What do you think? He's, how is he positioned? He's positioned positive, correct? But somebody who sees it half empty, what, what would he do? He might think, maybe let me finish the entire one. Let me finish the entire glass so that it's fully empty. That's what he's going to think. So the one who wants to fill it up fully, he 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 wants to go and fill wants to go and fill the water but it might appear that he's trying to be positive but it could be that he wants to fill it up because he wants to go and show it to the world that look i fill this water i fill this cup with with full water and he wants to show it to the world so now the intentions are negative so you know, for a moment back, we thought it was a positive, positive position, but actually, it he his intentions were negative. And the person who actually drank half of the water or emptied half of the water, uh, you know, immediately we think that may oh look his intention was like you know he he went and emptied the emptied the water, but maybe his intention could have been that that water has been lying there for a very long time and must have gone bad or something must have fallen in it. So let me go and clean the, um, the jar or the glass. So but it appears to us that he had a negative um, action, but his intention was very pure and very positive. So that's why when you look at it at, at the top level, you know, you might see somebody's action to be very positive. But when you go deep in the surface and actually see the intention, then you will realize that it is coming from ego or it's coming from selfishness. So Didi Khan came across a very sweet statement which said that if somebody doesn't know the self, of course he's going to be selfish then. 
So that's why first one is the psychological positioning and how is my intellect positioning, positive or negative? Positive will take me up the ladder and negative, of course, is going to bring me down in the ladder. And the second point is psychological limits. Because most of us, we make a comfort zone for ourselves. And we like to operate in that comfort zone. Did he's giving an example that during the rainy season, you know, normally, normally you would see a lot of flies and a lot of fleas, and they they are traveling uh, in a bunch in a group. And then if you. And if you enclose them in a glass jar or a glass box, you will realize initially they will first touch the, box, the glass box and they will bang against the glass box. They will bang, a, a bang on the glass box and then slowly, slowly they'll realize, oh, there's a glass box around them. And then they will uh, reposition themselves and then they will again fly such that they don't the glass box and they will get good at it where they are not going to touch the glass box and then after some time when you lift the glass box or the glass jar then you see that they are still going in the same direction or the same circumference because they're tuned they're tuned with the feeling that there's a glass box around them There was a video which has been circulated, like um, uh, an Indian lady who was who seems to be in her 90s, and she was dancing and she was doing some exercise. And the I the the point what Didi is driving to is that that you know the age is that we limit ourselves thinking that I'm 90, so I can't do these things. I can't, I can't dance or I can't exercise. So we limit ourselves. So we limit ourselves either uh, putting an age uh, on us. And then we, based on that limit, it could be like an age limit. And based on that, then we take decisions for us. That you know, I'm 90 years old. I don't, I can't dance or I can't exercise. So then we start putting these limits. And hence the the fly example, the flea example also, that they created their own limit. And even, even after the glass box was taken out, they were still in that, in that limit of theirs, which they had created. They were saying that, you know, in the initial days of Gyan, uh, there was only dadis and dudis at that time and very few brothers. So Baba made all the dadis and dudis be very aware that, that they are not females, that they should see themselves as just soul so that they're not limited to their sexuality. They're not limited to a woman or a feminine uh, body. And if they see themselves as just a soul, soul doesn't, soul has a lot of capacity and a lot of strength and has no limit. 
and hence then they will be able to do other things um, which typically a girl or a woman wouldn't want to do. So that's why the psychological limits go out of those limits. And the third one is assumptions. And she wants to give an example. That there was a person um, named Ramesh and he was sleeping. And while he was sleeping, his window was open. And uh, while he was sleep, I mean, he was in a, he was, he was slightly sleepy, slightly in an awake state of mind. And he could see that a robber, a thief has entered uh, the room through the window and opened the cupboard. And then he uh, and he took some valuables from the cupboard and he put, put it in his bag. And then the robber left and he went, uh, uh, the robber left and went out of the window. And this boy, Rami, was watching everything but did not react at all. And then the next day he goes and complains and puts a complaint uh, to the uh, at the police station, but he doesn't say anything to the family members in the house. He doesn't say anything to the family members. He watched the entire robbery. He watched the entire robbery happening, but he did not go and say and he did not go and say to any of the family members. Do you know why? Can you think and say why? He wants us to think and think as to why. What do you think about it? And Didi says, Didi says because Ramesh was actually a six month old baby. So Didi saying, see how, how our mind worked. It could have been so many things. It could have been so many, so many things. We were like, why, why couldn't, why, why, why didn't he go and complain? What was wrong with him? Was he physically handicapped, so he couldn't see, uh, could, so he couldn't do anything? Why didn't he, re, why didn't he react? So then, so he he didn't say he didn't react. He didn't do anything. Um, sorry, and he did not even go to the police station. I'm sorry, I mentioned that he went to the police station, but he did not even go to the police station. Um, so Didi is saying that we, we created so much of assumption around it. Didi did not mention his age. Didi did not mention that he was an old person, young person, or anything about that person. And then we fabricated, we started fabricating stories around it. That Ramesh, you know, why couldn't he do that? If he did not react, at least he should have gone and got to the police station and given a complaint. Because we took decision or we started thinking based on half decision, uh, sorry, half uh, information. So as Baby said, first is, the third one is assumption. And then when we don't have all the data points with us, then we make wrong decision. The fourth one is association of memories. And what she means by that is,
So what she means is that if someone is addicted to smoking and whenever he is doing nothing, when he's, you know, he's just sitting and doing nothing, he, he immediately will say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not doing anything. Maybe I need a cigarette right now. Or when he is just eaten food, he might have a cigarette. When he finishes doing a work, he'll have a cigarette. So he's associated to have a cigarette after every task. And he has created this feeling that he can only do, he can only operate after he has smoked a cigarette. And because of associating these memories that, that after every task I need to have a cigarette, then you get then you base your decision on that. They just given another example that in America there was um, there was research done on, on um, some women who were who were little, who were overweight who were obese um, who were obese and they were wondering as to what was happening why this trend was happening and then they realized that whenever they met whenever they met whenever whenever they met their friends. Um, they always met their friends over Coke, chips, or ice cream. And they started associating their meeting with, um, with their friends or meeting and watching a TV with having Coke, French fries, uh, and chips. So then slowly, slowly, what they did was started disassociating these things from um, their friends or from watching a TV. So one by one, they said, okay, fine. You have Coke, you have chips, and they took out the French fries. Slowly, slowly, then they took out the other two factors also. And then they realized that these women then suddenly started losing weight because they started, they had initially started associating a situation with, with eating. They associated, um, meeting friends with eating. And when you associate all these memories, then it becomes very difficult to decide because you, you have associated so many memories within you. We is giving a balance, uh, giving an example of a weighing machine, of a balance scale. You know, if like how in a balance scale, if both the things have to, both the weights have to be in balance, then only it stays in a perfect position, and based on that, then you're able to take the right decision. Same example with an archery. In archery also, when you when you are uh, when you are doing when you are with a bow and arrow and you're targeting a goal um, a, a bullseye with an arrow, while you're pulling the arrow, even a fraction for a fraction of a second, if your eye is not on the target or your fingers tremble, then the arrow is not going to hit the target. And the point she's deriving is that you have to be very focused. And just a little bit of, um, little bit of uneasiness or imbalance will not help us to make the right decision.
Dilti is giving an example of a swan. A swan who said to say that, um, that she's able to pick up, she's able to um, segregate between stones and pearls. That she's able to pick up what she needs um, and what she requires. So she's able to be very clean and clear and then able to decide what she wants. So that's how we have to keep our intellect also very clean and clear. They are also mentioning that your inner voice, your inner voice, which comes, which comes through wisdom, don't, don't neglect that, don't suppress that, because that is going to guide you properly. And then second is to have faith in your intellect. Have faith in your intellect. And hence, believe in yourself, have faith in yourself, because if you're confused, then naturally you're going to make a wrong decision. When you have faith in yourself, you will not go in panic. you will be able to make the right decision then. The next one is constructive or destructive internet. And what does she mean by destructive intellect? Destructive intellect is one who, um, you know, is uh, very, um, is either jealous of someone, or um, gets irritated very fast, uh, or if things don't go his way, then goes immediately into destruction. And constructive intellect is the one who is, you know, as the word says, constructive, is the one who will build, build things, build the relation. Build the bridges between two people if they're not having a good time. So a very beautiful example, she's saying that constructive is, is like, you know, like, um, like needle and thread, which is repairing, it's repairing relation, repairing the situation. And a destructive uh, intellect is like having a scissor and cutting, cutting all ties, you know, creating more stress in the situation. So she's giving an example. She's giving an She's giving an example that someone came to a tailor and um, said that, you know, can you help me with this garment? And the tailor uh, took the needle out from his turban. So back in India, people used to wear turban and he kept, he kept, uh, he kept the needle on his turban, so the, you know, as a safe place. So he uh, took out the needle and started sewing the garment. And when he wanted to cut the thread, he took the scissor, which was kept on his uh, between his toes. So the child who was watching his father do this had a question that why did you keep the needle on your turban and keep the scissor between your toes? Why didn't you keep the needle and the thread also with your toes or keep the scissor? Um, on uh, with, along with the needle and thread. And a beautiful example again, that the trainer said that a thing which brings things together or stitches, um, stitches the garment or stitches a problem together, that should be treated with 
full respect and should be kept kept uh, you know um in your turban so a turban is an ultimate sign of respect back in india um so that's why that you know he kept the needle and the thread in his turban and he said the same thing for the scissor that scissor does a work of um cutting or chopping um so that needs to be at its place So the next point um, she wants to bring attention to is determination. As determination brings us to success, brings us closer to success. And the next is farsightedness. As Devi said, that if as you can if you can perceive very clearly then you will be able to achieve also very clearly so perception has to be very clear when you have a very clear perception then you, then it's very easy to achieve and the last one is also mentioned in gita that your intelligence should have stability and the things which create instability in your mind what are those things which create instability so she's saying when your mind is very constrained that is very constrained then then that that causes you to have a uh, constraint or attraction sorry the word is attraction when you when you when your intellect is very uh, comes from comes from out of attraction then that will that will lead to wishes that will lead to more attraction and then that doesn't get fulfilled and that creates anger and in anger then you speak ill about someone or you create a bad situation and that becomes so overpowering that then you're not able to make the right decision and then the intellect what has the capacity to make the right decision gets very constrained because of all this and is not able to make the right choice and then knowledge knowledge is the one which will help us to have a stable mind Spiritual knowledge will help us to have a stable mind, and that's why it's very important that every day, through spiritual through knowledge and through meditation, we keep our mind sharp and keep our intelligent intellect sharp. And to do that, it's meditation and spiritual knowledge. which will help you to keep your mind and your intellect very sharp and very clear and that will then lead you to success om shanti we will meditate for some time so that so that we can sharpen our axe so for a few moments just relax your mind because when our mind is relaxed then our iq level increases
and uh, science also says that when a mind is very calm, our IQ is around 130. And if we are in a very confused state, our IQ drops down to 60, 65. And hence it's very important to be in a very relaxed state so that our IQ level increases. So for a few minutes, let's relax our mind. And see yourself in the center of the forehead as the sparkling, shining, going to meet. I am a very powerful soul. has been given two gifts by God. One is a beautiful, powerful intellect and the second is power of choice. in every situation, I have to use my intellect. And before I do that, I need to see how I have positioned my intellect. Is it positive? Do Have I created any comfort zone for myself? So keep your mind, keep your intelligence in positivity and free yourself from any assumption and make it as open and as fast as possible without limiting it, without limiting it with any memories of the past. without restricting it from any memories of the past. Our intellect, our intellect needs to be clean and clear. With full determination, with full belief and faith, with full concentration and constructive then only we will be able to make a right decision and are easily and can easily achieve success. Through spiritual knowledge and meditation, we have to sharpen our intelligence so that whenever a situation requires us to take a quick decision, we are able to respond, we are able to respond in a right manner.
using the divine using the divine power allowing the divine power to flow through us we allow our mind to get clean and clear and then our intellect can operate in its full capacity 